So, well, um, I can define myself as an activist who takes part in the anti-authoritarian, anti anti-capitalist, anti-racist, anti-sexist movements. My um, political engagement started in my university years within uh, student movements, but then afterwards more in the city of Istanbul within the social movements uh, of Istanbul and later participating in Gezi uprising as well. Like after Gezi, right after the Gezi, even though it seemed like the uprising was suppressed, we were still hopeful because like we saw a massive politicization uh, from various groups like from, uh, of people into the left movement and then there was a growing culture of political mobilization and like we like people could actually break their fear yeah after Gizzi there was this kind of a hope and then the situation started to aggravate gradually and then one year before, last summer, there was again a little bit of hope after the elections of June because like there was the um like you could see the outcomes of the Gezi resistance uh, the pro Kurdish party HDP could gain more power and then the absolute power of AKP had diminished but yeah unfortunately they could also manage to reverse this uh, situation as well and starting from the the Suruj bombing, especially after the uh, elections, um, I remember the like how they were how the government was saying that this shows us that we should uh, fight with all types of terror and terrorists, and then started to wage a war against more leftist or progressive or Kurdish movement in Turkey. And yeah, and then afterwards there were um, more bombing attacks. There was the Ankara bombing when people wanted to, yeah, especially after Suruj, the serious war started in the Kurdish region. The curfews, um, the attacks on the civilian people, and then people protesting against this on the streets in Ankara. They they were also like uh, bombed and like hundreds of people died and then the following uh, following this and other uh, other explosions other attacks to the left and I don't know massive um, campaigns at, against people uh, I don't know active in the leftist movement or in solidarity with Kurdish people even the academics for peace they were heavily attacked by, by the government many of them arrested or banned from their works so basically um, there was also not so much space left for the people on the left like um, you p people started to be afraid not only of police brutality, the police brutality was growing every day more and more, but also like there is the danger of explosions on the street or fascist mobs uh, attacking to leftist, leftist people or any uh, figure they see as opponent to them. Or yeah, or the injustice going on. If you are arrested, it's quite clear that you can be convicted of any crime, they can just name you as terrorist just because of signing a petition or something like this and then there's no way out. So people just didn't want to get arrested, so it became more and more difficult to be active and take the streets. And the pride of this year, in the gay pride, the, it was again, the situation is a bit like was a bit like this. I was there and um, there was a threat of a fascist mob uh, to attack to the people who would uh, possibly take the streets in gay pride. And then for this, many people from the organization as well said that they could not take this 
risk. And finally, from the organization, they said that they will not um, get together and do a demonstration, but they will spread. And from this message, we, we understood that we have to still be present in the Taksim area where the gay pride takes place, the center of Istanbul, but spread. Don't be a possible target for the fascist mobs. And then there were little actions going on. So somehow the left in Turkey also understood that we should um, develop different strategies because, I don't know, different times are coming. It's not so easy as before. And then this coup attempt happened on 15th of uh, July. This turned into a counter coup of Erdogan and this will help him to centralize uh, the power in his hand and in his state machinery. As also the Kurdish, Kurdish movement says, the coup indeed started with the last year's elections. There was a civilian coup already. So there was a first wave of coup from the uh, last year's elections. They renewed it in the November and with this war period in between they could manage to manipulate the votes and then afterwards there was this long time of curfews and state of emergency. And then this was the second line of coup, second wave of a civilian coup again. And what we see, okay, they uh, suppressed the military coup, but nowadays we are expecting, uh, like we are living in a situation of a civilian coup. They banned thousands and thousands of people from the public sector, like I think the numbers rise uh, above 60,000 and many people arrested and we're expecting huge structural changes in many key institutions of Turkey. But in the meantime, those who are um, banned or fired are also, were also not only from what is called the Gulen movement, Gulen terrorist movement as they call, but many people from the um, left movement or I don't know, those people from the uh, academicians for um, peace or people organized in um, labor unions, they are also fired in between. We can expect basically the times of like more centralized power in the hands of the uh, government, AKP government, and those who are close to their ideology should take more key roles in the main institutions of Turkey. And for example, the judiciary will also change a lot, so we don't know how the justice will be in the future in Turkey. Nowadays there is a state of emergency and we clearly cannot know what this will bring to us because they can basically rule um, anything they want with this laws. Yeah, many human rights violations are already happening and will keep happening. There were also reports on the coup plotters uh, to be tortured. There was already existing um, which we might call like a depression in the left activism because you are basically unable to act and there's also like a rightful fear you cannot take the streets and now you can expect many human rights violations to happen they also like after the coup they also for a while suspended the European Human Rights Convention it's a clear uh, it's a time of uncertainty, you don't know what we should expect. And one horrible thing we saw after the coup was the fascist mobs of Erdogan. Like, depending on one word of Erdogan, I mean, it was not only one word, it was a really uh, like strong campaign to call people on the street with free public transportation, calls from mosques and I mean per even personal SMS from Erdogan but still uh, with one word of Erdogan many people can take the streets and act really furiously. 
they can lynch people. There were also some cases of, that those mobs attacked to um, some leftist or Alevi um, neighborhoods, or we are hearing that there are more cases of harassment against women. There is a clear threat against any oppositionary voice to leftists, seculars, women, minorities, Alevi or Armenian or uh, Syrians. There were also racist attacks against Syrians' neighborhoods. And this threat can be active depending on one voice or one call from the state because then they know that they, are, they will be backed by the state machinery. They won't be um, they cannot be held uh, responsible of any unlawful action they are doing. So um, that's why from the left, or as I said, from all these oppos oppositionary groups, people are a bit um, kind of paralyzed, like not knowing what to do. But, for example, in the, as I said, in the last Pride, there was also different strategies developed, like dispersing or doing individual actions or stuff like this. And everybody nowadays is trying to be careful, as I know. Like, people are also trying to be more careful about the, uh, the on online area like what they share or how they can uh, use the tools to hide their IDs, IPs and stuff like this because this witch hunt can be extended to social media or like any kind of uh, platforms but other than this I think the left is also a bit confused in Turkey like not knowing how to act nowadays, people are either a bit more pacifies or I can expect also some groups to get more radicalized. There is already some new um, armed groups emerged in the last years, apart from the Kurdish PKK. They are maybe marginal and their actions are not seen so much in the uh, media, but they are also taking different strategies. What could be done from here to the Turkey, to, to the people on struggle in Turkey, like giving some support to empower uh, the left in Turkey. This can be also kind of uh, like an emotional healing for people for the left in Turkey to overcome their fear or their depression because what you can feel at the moment in Turkey is really like a kind of darkness, a tension when you go there. There is really growing polarization in the society. Everybody sees each other as a threat and there is this growing fear because of the uh, because of the violence everywhere, not only in Kurdish region but also in the main cities of Turkey or ev everywhere in Turkey. And this growing machinery of total control, the government. So you are totally incapacitated, and the people also have some traumas since Gezi movement or since the last year people have traumas because of the police violence or because of the news, because of losing their friends, because of what you see in the news in your daily life. How can we have a common strategy of action? <laughs> I can say. With people uh, in solidarity in Europe, in Germany, in Berlin, wherever. Because, yeah, as I said, as people, as these oppositionary voices, leftist people in Turkey are incapable, I think they uh, definitely need some kind of solidarity from outside of Turkey as well.
and yeah one main line of action can be uh, starting a strong campaign against the EU Turkey deal uh, because first of all what happened in Turkey in this not only the coup but also everything in last year shows that Turkey is not a safe country and it was not a safe country ever um, not only for Syrian refugees but anyone basically and um, this deal is also really problematic because it puts the rights of the asylum seekers against the populist politics of Erdogan so they can just claim that they're like Erdogan can just claim that they will give a visa free travel right to the citizens of Turkey if they will send if they can send back the uh, or readmit the refugees from crossing the Europe and there's anyways a growing racism in Turkey against the refugees. This just turned into something like a tool in the hand of Erdogan to just make more populist um, claims. Like just to give him a better image, like as if he, were, he had a better, good relations with Europe, with strong leaders like Merkel, but while he, he had this really um, horrible conditions in terms of human rights and uh, operation in, inside Turkey. So we should definitely uh, start a campaign against EU-Turkey deal, any kind of action strategies to uh, claim the uh, cancelling of the EU-Turkey deal. Well, after the EU-Turkey deal, definitely one thing is how they, how the state started to construct more detention centers, more the camps which indeed served as detention centers and then the uh, migrants and refugees just, they could be randomly called and sent to these places and then you don't know what's happening. I mean, one uh, outcome of the readmission agreement is that it vulnerable. It made the position of uh, migrants and refugees more vulnerable in Turkey. Yeah. And the other outcome is that, um, as I tried to say, um, I think it just served for Erdogan to um, polish his uh, image. A bit more because in the last years he there were some diplomatic crises he had really bad relations with many countries and then finally he could provide a good image speaking with Merkel and I don't know acting as if all Europe depends on Turkey's role and we have a really important role and then they will um, give visa free travel right to the Turkish citizens and not from my circles, people around me, but I can imagine that supporters, for supporters of Erdogan, this was a good achievement. When we speak about solidarity actions, what people um, think of and at the first hand is just going in front of Turkish embassies and doing a demonstration, but I personally don't find this really um, useful because you don't have a democratic authority in front of you which can take this uh, public criticism into consideration but this could indeed just like play in the hand of Erdogan to um, develop his discourse more about how the growing threats from outside is uh, targeting Turkey and the power and the integrity of Turkey is under threat by the outside forces but indeed, yeah, we can just uh, make our fight more common and then also just um, pose this um, fight or this action against the European institutions as well. Like, that's why I think that we should make a strong campaign against the EU-Turkey deal and then we should 
claim that Turkey is not a safe country in front of European institutions as well? Well, those solidarity actions also should not only target Erdogan, I think, but in general the growing fascism in Turkey, in Europe, everywhere. Because there is growing fascism in Turkey, supported by Erdogan regime. But also there is this growing fascism of Turkish people in Europe, again supported by Erdogan. But on the other hand, there is a really growing fascism, like increasing uh, the support to the right in all Europe, in European Union, in European states. So we should make our struggle more common against any kind of growing fascism, so that we don't let it go, we don't let it grow in any way. Thank mm -hmm. you.